A couple things I want to just kind of say at the outset and then jump into uh, our discussion. Um, this is a time in which I think some of the things we've taken for granted for our entire lives are under attack. Whether it's globally, the climate, uh, whether it's domestically, our constitution, or whether it's philosophically even a consensus that there are universal or shared uh, truths that we hold. And so the urgency of this conversation and the work of the Bergun Institute has never, I think, been more important. And we're very blessed to have two folks who come from that, one who started it and who's obviously uh, the eponymous founder of, of the Bergun Institute, but also to have that based here in Los Angeles as well. And we're very honored and one of the reasons I absolutely accepted the invitation from Nicholas to be a part of this conversation is Los Angeles is a place that it very much is the crossroads geographically philosophically of the world today. Um, one proof point just on how Los Angeles is the center of the universe in many ways. New York to London was the number one air uh, travel corridor transoceanic since the beginning of, uh, of air travel. Um, just two years ago, Los Angeles to the east coast of China displaced that and probably will never go back in our lifetimes. 43% of the goods that come into America come through this city through our twin ports of LA and Long Beach and we're the intersection of Latin America North America and the Pacific Rim all in one city. If we didn't have LA, we'd probably have to build it just given the global forces. So this book, which by the way, quick show of hands, who has the book yet? All right, all good, right. that's a good start. Good now over in this section, you get 10% off tonight. <laughs> Two for one if you want, but this is, um, for somebody whose life is very busy, um, it was a welcome read, an urgent read, and one that I really do commend to each one of you. And I'm sure they'll be selling their books, but I wanted to say that this is an impartial uh, person who has looked at this. The idea of renovating democracy couldn't come at a more urgent time. Um, and to Nathan and Nicholas, we're really uh, um, so lucky to have two such sharp minds that at a moment when people are looking for distilled and absolutist truths, are really, I believe in this book, building a bridge of practicality, both in how we think about and how we enact um, whether it's cultural divides, how we can bridge those, whether it's philosophical divides, and as somebody who is a practitioner, how we can actually put these things into action. Before we get to those ideas and those suggestions, though, Nicholas, tell us a little bit about the Bergeron Institute and why you decided to form it and what its goals are. Well, Mayor, number one, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And I'm honored to be here with you and obviously with Nathan, the co-founder of the Institute. And I sort of feel that things are upside down. Uh, we should be listening to you. In fact, <laughs> you're so good. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, we shouldn't just turn everything around. Um, so, uh, the Institute was created really with the very simple thought that if we can have a center that helps the development of ideas long term in a nonpartisan way, um, ideas that would address the key issues of the world, opportunities, but also challenges, um, it would be a good endeavor. Mm -hmm. To do it here in Los Angeles sort of happened, in my case, by chance, but nothing is really by chance. I grew up in Paris and lived in New York and then moved here to the edge of the West. And I agree with you, I think this century, the Pacific century, to put the Institute here, and on purpose, the Institute is here and also in Beijing, so mm -hmm. the two sides in two different cultures. And we felt that the Institute could be a forum to develop ideas, to foster thinking in a way that enables, uh, we hope, fresh thinking around key issues. And the key issues that we focused on are democracy, mm -hmm. capitalism, mm -hmm. geopolitics, mm -hmm. and the human. Mm -hmm. Who can we be? Because we can reinvent ourselves thanks to gene editing and AI. So that's why. So um, tell us a little something, too, about the Bruggen Prize, um, because I think, in my thinking, it's right up there with the Nobel, the Pritzker, the other things, and it filled a, a void that maybe we need even more than just celebrating great buildings and scientific breakthroughs. What does it do, and, and uh, uh, who have been some of the recipients? So the, the prize was created really to honor ideas and thinkers. If you think about who we are, all our cultures, they were shaped at the end by individuals who mm -hmm. changed the mindset. And these may have been philosophers, but sometimes religious thinkers, sometimes scientists. So it's everyone from Galileo to Jesus Christ to Confucius. So those were some Marx. of the winners? Well, 
<laughs> that's a challenge. You challenge to find the ones who may be that significant. But the idea is every year, um, someone should receive a prize for their thinking, for the way they um, affect us. And we've had it now for three years. Uh, Martha Nussbaum was the winner last year. She's a philosopher uh, based in Chicago who worked on something I think that's very important uh, called um, capabilities, meaning giving everyone the capacity in life to start with a few things. Mm -hmm. And what are those things? The year before was Nora O'Neill, a lady, a British lady, uh, who thought about ethics and technology. And the year before was Charles Taylor, a mm -hmm. Canadian. Um, and this year, just please, this is um, something you can all us help us with, please nominate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can each nominate who you think should win the prize. It's a million dollar prize that we'll um, give in the fall. And if you can nominate someone, we'd be very grateful. If there's a website, go on it, please. Can you nominate yourself if you think you're a really good thinker? If anybody out here, <laughs> politicians are off the list. No, no, no I'm, I'm not. Sorry, trust sorry. me, I couldn't take the money anyway, so don't worry. Um, so let's turn to the book. Um, we live in a very interesting time that I think you so uh, beautifully describe. Um, I've given a new word. Feel free to steal it or use it. Um, I, I'd say this is a time where there is incredible excitement and incredible anxiety. So what do you do when you put those together? It's a feeling of excitement. You know that feeling like when you're about to come on a stage and give a speech or think about this moment as you talk about and here and others, you know, we have technological breakthroughs that help us order up a car and buy something with one click and FaceTime our children from across an ocean and yet you wonder, will that technology work me out of a job? There's breakthroughs in human health that we couldn't imagine in gene editing and artificial intelligence, but then people are struggling just the basics to pay for medical insurance. So they're one accident away from being bankrupt uh, from medical emergency. So in this age of anxiety, I want to kind of start there. Um, you talk a lot about how people have gone to populism and other things. Um, is this an, an age, in your opinions, maybe we'll start with you, Nathan, that mm -hmm. you feel that human beings are capable of reacting to the velocity of change that's coming at us? Um, because before we get into the specifics, are we even capable of an era in which we can find those answers and adapt to them? Uh, well, speaking to a political leader, I think we have to be capable. Mm -hmm. or else. Um, I think what, what's happening is just as you mentioned, is this, is this gap, people feel uh, uh, drowning in the swell of anonymous, anonymous forces, mm -hmm. technology, globalization, etc. cetera. Um, and in that swell, um, they lose their sense of grounding and sense of identity. And uh, we're in more prosperous times or in less uh, restless times, People have more open, plural dimensions in, the, in their personality and their communities. In these tough times, um, uh, people's identity shrinks to what the, what the uh, uh, philosopher Amartya Sen calls solitarist. They become singular. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one dimension becomes their existential importance. Uh, and I think that's the basis of this populist reaction that we are seeing. Um, and yes, I mean, always in history, people have been able to respond to these kind of crises, because crises always emerge when there's a technological leap, and then the politics and society have to catch up. Um, and there's no reason not, not to do it again. Mm -hmm. The reason we, we not be able to do it again, the reason we focus on democratic deliberation of the book is that's the mechanism which open societies have to deal with these problems. And if that mechanism is dysfunctional, mm -hmm. then the answer is no, we can't reach it. Mm -hmm. So the aim of the book is to really talk about how do we fix the two or three key dimensions of the dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the way we, the context we, we put it in the book is that um, uh, what we are facing is the rise of populism, the context is the rise of populism in the West, the rise of China in the East, and the spread of social media everywhere mm -hmm. is making us doubt uh, whether democracy works or how democracy works or doesn't work. Um, Globalization and digital capitalism uh, is creating new classes of winners and losers that the social contract we have doesn't fit. It's mm -hmm. not configured to fit those. So in the book, we try to look at the, the two paradoxes. Uh, and I'll just lay this out real quick because it's a frame for the book. We focus on the two paradoxes um, uh, that have to be answered to, to answer your question. Um, 
where China comes in, before the paradox, where China comes in is China's rise challenges the dysfunctional West mm -hmm. to figure out a way to get beyond the paralysis uh, and polarization uh, that we have today by other than authoritarian means or risk sinking into second class status on the world stage. We have a president uh, who relishes um, uh, hurling barbed tweets at sundry foes to dominate every 24 hour news cycle when the president of China has laid out a roadmap for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. If we continue on that path, uh, we're going to be second class status. Mm -hmm. So the paradox that have to be answered have to do one with democracy and one with the political economy. Uh, on the democracy side, the participatory power of social media is, I, I think you would agree with this, is a game changer in politics. Mm -hmm. um, it, it brings you know, massive more players into the political fray. Um, and uh, when you have that many players, you need to have uh, the commensurate and, and countervailing practices and institutions to sort out and mediate in an impartial way the cacophony of voices, the welter of conflicting interests, and the deluge of contested information. Um, so we talk in the book about participation without populism, how to bring citizens more back into the process, mm -hmm. to bind self-government and the institution, the institution of self-government and people uh, in a way that uh, uh, puts it through a deliberative filter so you don't end up with a Brexit, but you end up with what are the consequences of a Brexit before we go down this road. So that's the one element. The other element is, has to do with the nature of the digital economy itself. The nature of the digital economy, uh, and I'll say this slowly and repeat it, <laughs> is that the, the um, digital economy is divorcing employment and income from productivity, growth, and wealth creation. Mm -hmm. That is, people are being put out of jobs by intelligent machines. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, the paradox is that the more dynamic this digital economy, uh, which it is in California, especially, and spreading throughout sure. the world. The more dynamic this digital economy, the more robust the safety net and opportunity web must be to deal with the steady disruption and, uh, and consequences for wealth and power. Well, let's dig into that second one first and no. then return to democracy, which is a pretty easy thing to solve after that. Um, we have at this moment, I would call them radical ideas. And I don't, that's not an editorial, but people are, I think, willing to take bigger risks obviously on people who might be the representatives, but also on ideas of in this moment when people don't trust institutions, they fear globalization, they live in this age of excitement, of what we can do to make a more equal economic system. So Nicholas, I mean, one of the things that you talk about in here is the idea of pre-distribution instead of redistribution. A lot of the radical ideas that people have, see presidential candidates, a wealth tax, um, a higher income tax, um, but there's also people talking about things like basic universal income. Um, when I think about homelessness in Los Angeles, which is the biggest issue I work on, we're going to be spending a historic amount. We've doubled the number of people we're taking out of homelessness and, and basically treading water because of the number of people being pushed into homelessness. And it costs us a couple hundred thousand dollars at least to build a new unit of housing when some people have said, if you can find them, for $5,000 of subsidy, you could have kept somebody in housing that wouldn't have wound up on the street and be much more expensive if we had a better pre-distributive system. So walk us through that and why you both emphasize the idea of pre-distribution instead of redistribution as the way forward for capitalism to work better. So I think without any doubt, capitalism has conquered the world. But no matter where you are, here, but also in China, in pretty much every country, inequality is increasing. Mm -hmm. And that's an imbalance. And imbalances, after a while, you know, break the system. So how do you rebalance? And the traditional ways of doing it were raise taxes, transfer money from one side to the other. I think now there's some innovative ideas which are the universal basic income, you know, give everybody a minimum. Mm -hmm. But it's still a subsidy. It still creates winners and losers. And what we've been thinking about, how can we bring everybody into the same boat, be inclusive from the beginning, as opposed to having winners and losers and then try to sort things out, have everybody really share in the growth mm -hmm. of the country, as opposed to having to rejigger. 
So the idea, which we call pre-distribution for uh, universal basic assets mm -hmm. as opposed to universal basic income, is that everybody would have a stake in everything that society has. And it sounds maybe quite wonderful, and the question is, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. yeah, so play that out practically, what does in, that mean? In, in a simple idea, and we are very early days, sure. um, the simple idea is as follows, and you can only do it with businesses or enterprises going forward. You can never go backwards. But let's say um, Eric starts a business. Mm -hmm. uh, you could dedicate, and you own the business, so you're a capitalist, mm -hmm. uh, but you dedicate, let's say, 20% of your business to a state fund. Mm -hmm. And the state fund is like a big sovereign wealth fund that everybody benefits from. So everybody's an owner of that fund. But the everybody owns or everybody in the, in the society? Everybody in society. Mm -hmm. So everybody in society, that means everybody here, mm -hmm. including you, uh, would own a piece of Eric's new business. Mm -hmm. And um, that means if you're successful, everybody here is successful. Mm -hmm. And you, as opposed to being on the other side of that, we're all in some ways participants. We're all shareholders mm -hmm. in the same enterprise. So the advantage of it is that if you accumulate it over lots of businesses, the new Googles, the new Facebooks, etc., it becomes not only a lot of money, but a lot of cash flow over time, and that can help fund the budget. Mm -hmm. And the budget itself then pays for lots of different things that are key edu education, healthcare, mm -hmm. housing, security, but could even uh, uh, pay for a universal basic income. Mm -hmm. So you could take everything out of you know that umbrella. But that umbrella yeah, brings people to together. Sorry, That's right. I can do that. Can I yeah, just add something? Yeah. So, I mean, just to follow the, the mm -hmm. point about why it's related to the digital economy mm -hmm. is as people are put out of work by intelligent machines, mm -hmm. uh, they need to have an equity share in the robots that are displacing them and the mm -hmm. companies that are using intelligent, machine, intelligent machines to increase productivity. Um, and uh, that's what we call universal basic capital. If you want to address inequality seriously, you have to spread the equity around. Some examples, just, just real quick, ahead, some examples ahead. about how that would work mm -hmm. is everyone investing, as Nicholas mentioned, in a, some kind of a mutual uh, mm -hmm. fund type instrument or combined with venture capital pools. They do this in Singapore and other type of places. Also, the idea of platform cooperatives, where we all, we all are familiar with, um, with Lyft and Uber. Uh, neighborhoods could do the same thing. They could own ride sharing services mm -hmm. and all take a piece of it through some blockchain technology or, as we suggested to Governor Newsom, um, uh, we can have a data dividend, mm -hmm. where we all get a royalty for the, uh, well, the use of our personal data, which the big companies use. And after the discussion with the governor, uh, he put it in the state of state speech and says, let's have a data dividend. Now That's we're great. trying to figure out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easy part of suggesting. Yeah. Well, you, you talk about data as the new oil, um, that in many ways it is the, the currency of today. It's the greatest thing to mine, but it's not physical, so uh, people don't think about it the same way. You know, Alaska, if you're an Alaskan, you get a check every, or Norwegian, as you point out in the book, you get a, a check that comes from those resources, but data is the opposite. We're giving the greatest thing that we have and, and you know, giving it away, essentially. We went through this, um, I'm sure there's some people, anybody get here tonight on an electric scooter? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I won't do a show of hands of who loves them and hates them, but electric scooters, you know, we're estimating there's about 5 million trips a year right now in Los Angeles area uh, from electric scooters, so people are voting with their feet. But we had a big back and forth with the companies, Lyft and Uber and Bird, about whether their data would just be controlled by them or whether they had to share it with us. Not so that we'd know anybody's particular details, but so we could manage your streets better. If 10,000 um, electric scooters show up at Staples Center, that presents a common problem for us to manage the traffic, make sure people can walk, et cetera. And the end, they were willing to, to share that data with us, in, a, in a, other words, to give us that dividend. So how do we monetize, either at the individual level or the societal level, data which right now, in a very libertarian country, uh, we believe capitalism um, should keep, but in a very digital moment, I think a lot of us are surprised about how much of ourselves is owned by somebody else. Well, in essence, we all work for Facebook, we all work for Google, we all work for Uber mm -hmm. by providing them uh, with our data. So should we get a share of that? And uh, how? 
I think that you know that's a way to rebalance things. But you you can't attack specific companies, but you you can you have to change the system. And what we're proposing is more of a systemic change. Uh, as Nathan said, how do you share uh, the the robot? And unless we find a way of doing it, uh, we're not going to be happy as humans because most of us. Um, won't be employed in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. there, there is a, sac a discussion in Sacramento and elsewhere about how to do this data dividend. Um, uh, whether it's uh, distributed directly to the public that uses the internet, uh, whether it goes to, uh, the, whether, whether the state levies a royalty on uh, the Google and Microsoft and, and uh, Facebook and everyone who operates in California into a fund, which is then distributed with your tax return. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's mechanics, but the principle is that we should be compensated for our data. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a form of pre-distribution. So I guess mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to make of owning equity yep. in, in these companies. So there are many ways it can be done, but mm -hmm. the principle is that owning the robots uh, that are the future of digital capitalism, we should have a share in it. Mm -hmm. And I just to, on, on the political front, it's important point I think should be in the democratic debates going forward in the pres presidential mm -hmm. race. Is it a debate between pre distribution and pre-distribution? Mm -hmm. If you really want to address inequality, you have to take this into account. So uh, I think that's, at, at the end, the best formula is that everybody owns a piece of this new oil, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, distributions per usage and all that, because that creates perverse incentives. Right. So if everybody is a shareholder at the top, Mm -hmm. uh, then everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. So if your neighbor is a, a you know is bigger user than you, you still benefit, mm -hmm. and everything equalizes out, mm -hmm. you know, over time, mm -hmm. as opposed to, uh, you know, creating uh, perverse incentives right. at the user level. Absolutely. Just just your um, uh, intellectual break for the moment. I just read uh, two days ago the third most productive oil field in all of America is right here in Los Angeles. Two billion barrels of oil have been pulled out of the Wilmington oil field, which is to the south towards the, the harbor, and there's a billion barrels left there. There's one bigger one in Alaska, one bigger one in Texas. Unlike Alaska, we never had a common dividend, and every time people tried to in the past in California do that, it was beaten by the oil companies. I, I think we're going to jump over oil and, and become the uh, green energy capital of the world, hopefully, but interesting side note. So let's go to the first um, uh, point and talk about democracy, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. And anything that's enticing, please, again, buy this book. It's a really great book, a great read. Um, I think there's a lot of detail we won't be able to get to tonight, but I commend it to you, because it's a, uh, it's a deep and a, a provocative read as well. But what does it mean to renovate democracy now? Because you really, you do three things. You, you put out um, kind of the philosophy of these two things, but you also have a narrative that's overarching, which is the US-China um, relationship. And we'll come to that next, but we live in a democracy. It's very different than the Chinese political system, although they have an interesting kind of uh, intra-democracy within the party of, of a meritocracy and ideas and a consensus building. But here it's a free-for-all, right? Go to a town hall about a, uh, putting a homeless um, you know, temporary housing shelter in Venice, and trust me, you'll see democracy at its, at its finest. <laughs> and. Um, you know, Rousseau once said that the only true democracy is enough people that can sit around a tree and see each other. But now what passes as democracy is tweet storms, counter tweets. It's the ability, again, that velocity of information as well. And a lot has been written about the demise of liberal democracy. Some, certainly those writing from China and other places, talk about its weakness. We still, I think, experience its strength and certainly wouldn't give it up for anything else. But how do we reboot it? How do we renovate democracy? And how does this fit into... Uh, uh, your overall conversation. In the book, uh, we, uh, we do an interesting exercise where we go back to the founding fathers and the principles of, uh, of uh, the first constitution, mm -hmm. and then go forward to the progressive era, 100 years later, when the concepts of governance change completely between the progressive era and the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. The founding fathers uh, came to the, the, uh, the constitution after their experience in the states that became independent uh, after British, uh, British left. So there's a 10-year period there in which they, they governed the, the provisional uh, states before the Constitution. This experience, in which there was a lot of direct democracy mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of fiscal instability, 
led the founding fathers to not like democracy. <laughs> uh, and on top of that, they read uh, Greek history and Roman history uh, and saw why the Republic of, of Rome collapsed and why Greek democracy uh, uh, killed Socrates, for mm -hmm. example. So um, the word democracy is not mentioned in the Bill of Rights or the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution because the Founding Fathers wanted the Republic, mm -hmm. which meant uh, uh, a division of powers where each would check the other. Uh, and there were filters between the public and, gov and power. Mm -hmm. So there was a uh, electoral college, which we talk a lot about these days. There was an indirectly elected Senate. Uh, there's a Supreme Court, et cetera. All these filters in between to kind of peep, keep the people down. Um, but the experience that they came to came through, th their innovation experience came through their experience in the states before the Constitution. A hundred years later, um, uh, with patronage in the, in the party system, with the growth of factions, what the founding fathers called factions, which were parties uh, and machines and, and cities especially, you had corruption and you had uh, technological disruption, much like we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, then was the Industrial Revolution. And the progressives said, well, the elite is not doing the job, the establishment is not doing the job, the people should make the rules, mm -hmm. and they introduced direct democracy of the citizens' initiative, the referendum, and the recall. But also and at civil the service uh, and, civil and, service. and city managers for the first time. I was getting to that. The yeah. other thing that they did uh, was smart government. Mm -hmm. Instead of having the cronies run the city, yeah. they had city managers. Mm -hmm. So they combined direct democracy with, uh, with smart government, but in the states. Mm -hmm. Now, some of that bubbled up to the, to the national level, in, uh, direct election of Senate and so on. But what we try to do in the book after tracing that history is say, because of this explosion of, of social media, because of the greater participation, because of the penchant for direct democracy around the world, the five-star movement in Italy came to power mm -hmm. under the slogan, participate, don't delegate. Mm -hmm. We saw Brexit. People don't trust the establishment. They want to make the rules themselves. If that's the trend of history, we need to figure out what to do about it. And this is the, the renovation part is you're not removing, you're keeping the foundation, but you're uh, refitting the wiring and the appliances. So what we're proposing is if the trend is going towards direct democracy and citizens having more direct control, there needs to be the same kind of mediating institutions that the founding fathers imagined um, to be sure to, like I said before, you know, to sort through the welter of conflicting interests and the cacophony of voices and all the uh, misinformation uh, and magical thinking that's going on. So we propose in the book ways to do that. You can do it by citizens' assemblies. You can do it in California. We we changed the initiative law in 2014. I don't know if Senator Bob Hertzberg is here. He helped shepherd that. Senator um, Hertzberg? So that, so that when 25% uh, of, of people qualify uh, in qualifying, 25% of signatures gathered to qualify an initiative, the legislature has to have a hearing. They have to talk with the sponsors. They have to see if they can do it in the legislature mm -hmm. or if they can compromise some way, fix unintended consequences, and the sponsors can withdraw. It's just the step mm -hmm. of getting a second reading of direct democracy. Because in California, we are a direct democracy. We have a governor, and we have a legislature. Mm -hmm. But just to think about it, all the consequential decisions, taxes, budget, environment, are all made by citizens at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is, if that's the trend, we need, to, we need to design new institutions that deal with that. That's the renovating democracy so, part. So what role does local government play in this, in your mind, Nicholas? The, um, and it's been interesting at the national level. Let me insert one thing while you're thinking about that. Um, watching some of the town halls of some of the candidates who are pursuing the Democratic nomination, uh, one line stuck with me that my dear friend, uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, and that's how you say his name, Buttigieg, for anybody who's wondering, of South Bend, Indiana, said when we were talking, he was talking about the Supreme Court um, and the Electoral College, and he said, it's not as if the Founding Fathers didn't want us to be ambitious intellectually as well. <laughs> you know, obviously they were, but they weren't perfect women slaves, you know, all sorts of mistakes that were made, and yet, as Americans, we're so cautious about having that sort of ambition they had, and yet this moment calls for ambition. So at the national level, we're cautious, but at the local level, I think it's the most vibrant place, I know I'm biased, but it's the most vibrant place to test things, not just policy-wise, but in, even in the practice of democracy. So are there any ideas at, the, at that local or state level, and you've been very tied in at the state level, I know you mentioned what you, uh, uh, what's changed with our um, initiatives, but of, of trying to layer in this renovated democracy? Well, so I think the, the name of the book is Renovating a Democracy. 
to change anything is very hard. To change a system that's worked for a long time, actually work, you know, well, but has a lot of, um, let's call it vested interest, mm -hmm. is even harder. Mm -hmm. And to change uh, this system at, let's say, the federal level um, is incredibly difficult. But what I think we've seen, and I think what is possible, going back to uh, the great state uh, we are in, I think that you can truly think about some of these issues and make changes and make reforms at the state level, uh, at the city level, because one, you're closer to uh, governance at a, at a level that's still big, but somewhat smaller. But two, um, in California especially, because of the referendum system, the tools are there to actually do some of the reforms. And uh, the system here is so dynamic, uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes not, but that the system is, I think, more ready to accept changes. Mm -hmm. So we are very focused on California because I think it's the place that's open for change. Strangely enough, this will sound a little crazy mm -hmm. and uh, politically incorrect, mm -hmm. uh, but California, where it is today, um, is really almost like a one-party system. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Republicans have less and less of a voice, but the, that means you can do more, but it also puts a lot more pressure to perform. Because if you have a monopoly of power, you have no choice but to perform. So that means that... Um, it's more like the, China in some way. Well, the people <laughs> who are elected, but that, in, uh, you know, the people who are elected who are res responsible, really then have a lot of pressure to perform. If they're not going to perform, they're definitely going to be out. There's nobody else to blame. Mm -hmm accept themselves. So I think that the chances of uh, doing some of the reforms, testing some of the ideas in terms of reforming uh, democracy and also some of the ideas of reforming capitalism could be done more easily at the state level. And obviously at the city level, you can engage citizens all the time mm -hmm. on all the key issues, homelessness, housing, transportation. You can engage them uh, in a very direct way and they can inform you and again, it's a way to test uh, well, I'm, democracy. I'm surprised how little we do that. Um, I know we have to get to China and, and Q&A, so I, I know there's a million things to say on everything, but uh, one of the things we started doing with LAPD recently is we started polling once a year, Angelinos, about their feelings of crime and their feelings of LAPD. Because it was one thing to say, okay, crime's down 10% or it's up 5% or whatever. It's another thing to say, how do you feel about safety in your community and how do you feel about the Los Angeles Police Department and to measure that. We didn't have tools to to assess things, but that's as critical as the crime statistics are. Um, when we think about issues, you know, here on the Expo line, when we opened it up, traditionally it's City Hall, the conspiracy of City Hall developers who want to upzone things, and communities under, you know, siege with too much traffic saying they just want to make a buck out of City Hall and developers, but when we held, held hearings about upzoning along rail lines so that we can keep people who are working class actually living where we're making these investments, there was this whole host of millennials and young people who said, you guys aren't upzoning it enough. And we figured out, you know, how do we begin to inform people, um, get their opinion, give them the tools and the information that aren't biased so that they can participate in something more than a, a tweet and a counter tweet as well? I, I, that's exactly what I was going to suggest to you. That we talk about this in the book. In Ireland last year, they had citizens' assemblies mm -hmm. where you bring together in a depoliticized space the stakeholders, the pro and cons, and the experts. Mm -hmm. And they, they looked at abortion, which is a highly emotional issue, and were able to come to consensus mm -hmm. to take a, a measure out of the Constitution. But in your own city, for example, you need those kind of forums that bring people together, deliberative forums. Mm -hmm. So in my own neighborhood, uh, where Woodland Hills abuts mm -hmm. hidden, hidden Hills in Calabasas, mm -hmm. um, all these drug rehab and sober living houses are opening up. Mm -hmm. And the rumors are flying everywhere. No one has information. You know, it's the drug companies who have a new way to make profits. Mm -hmm. There's 12 of them in the neighborhood. No, there's 50 of them in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The crime rate is raising because of this. Mm -hmm. There's no information. The city's not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Citizens, if the city brought everyone together, mm -hmm. and not just to ask their feelings, but what do we actually do about it? Right. What, how do we come to a consensus on it? Like the, if the homeless thing maybe, mm -hmm. it has that kind of process taking place to build consensus. So the similar type of thing. It's the deliberative element and citizen, of citizen engagement, which is really at the root of, of a lot of what we're talking and about. We, and we're not, 
proposing that these citizens' committees then make these decisions, mm -hmm. that they inform, mm -hmm. and, they, and they inform government and they inform citizens. Mm -hmm. So that way, citizens can make better decisions and government is informed as to you know, the true feelings of citizens. So that's not necessarily the system in China. <laughs> um, you have a, a really great description that will probably piss people off in China and the United States of both systems. You'll have people in the United States quite defensive about how we're definitely better than that. And in China, I think you have one of the most sympathetic uh, descriptions of what works there and undeniably what has raised people out of poverty and is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, a leadership um, point on the horizon that is a really about the winning the future, not about just this moment. But you still have a critical voice on um, how the lack of participation and, and the system there that doesn't have the same freedom. Um, I was blown away in January when I had the, the great honor of mediating the teachers' strike. How little conversation had gone on between the teachers' union and the school district. I'm used to people talking, fighting it out, having some relationships even when they disagree. And we had to, re we had to establish a culture of commonality where they got to know each other, even knew each other's life stories, some of the principles there. And, and five days in the, into all night into a six, we kind of forged an agreement there and are building a new culture, I hope, of participation around um, education even where we disagree. I bring that up because I'd say the same thing about U.S.-China relations. I've been deeply involved in that. My parents took me to China in 1983 as a 12-year-old, right after it opened up. I've been involved in exchanges through the Center for American Progress and others. You've had very unique access to the top Chinese thinkers, and you detail that in here. I mean, that, that in itself is a reason to read this book. But I'm blown away by how few, whether the next generation or current leaders, in both countries know each other. When you compare it to United States and UK, that's easy. We speak the same language. But even the U United States and Germany or Israel or exchanges between other places, we have people who know each other, have had these discussions about our differences. But the United States and China, there's a huge gulf. And almost like the ideologies of pick your side in the United States, it's back one or the other and not a lot of space in between to learn, which I think the Bergun Institute is pushing forward. Is it inevitable that we're headed for some sort of clash, as, as she talks about the Thucydides, Thucydides trap of Athens and Sparta, as Graham Allison has written about it? We see a president who's doing things to confront China, um, to, as you point out, change the mercantilist and unfair rules there, which I think everybody is for, but at the same time, there's not a new culture of trying to get a lot of next generation Chinese and American thinkers together, Chinese and American leaders together, and figure out how we sort that together. It's kind of an either or right now. So the question is, can we coexist? Yeah. If we cannot coexist, it's going to be very hard to have peace and prosperity. And I think that it, we would be delusional to think, well, uh, we're going to win, they're going to lose. Uh, and I think they would be delusional if they think we're going to win, they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. Because um, we're too big on both sides. And the cultures are incredibly different. The political systems are incredibly different. But unless we find a way, as you say, to create a relationship and create a degree of respect between these two very different uh, cultures, we're going to have trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have to find a way to at least understand and respect each other in coexistence. In this case, I think, this is long term. You know, Chinese have done all types of things that you know, we, we can't accept or that anyone cannot accept uh, in terms of trade practices, et cetera, et cetera. But over time, uh, China successful, America successful, the West successful in general means everybody wins. And it feeds, uh, you know, both sides. Uh, if one is a loser, one, the other one a winner, it actually, I don't think that equation will exist. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think everybody loses. So we have to be in my mind, uh, uh, clear in terms of where the direction is. Um, and how we do it is very tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, as you say, the relationships are almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. The trade war is one thing. I assume it will get resolved. But the civilizational clash, I think, has just begun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to find a way to navigate it so that we continue to have a, a world of at least uh, coexistence.
uh, just two quick points because I know you want to go on the on, on how China operates. I think uh, I think it is important us as an advertisement to read that part of the book to understand. We start that China part of the book by quoting Lee Kuan Yew, mm -hmm. who says China will not be a democracy. It will not be an honorary member of the West. Mm -hmm. You got to start there. Uh, the problem with the West is, is it only focuses on China's repression, and China is definitely a repressive place. The Uyghur camps, everything else, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, surveillance state, everything. But China's system is also responsive to its people. As you mentioned, it raised 700 million people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. There's an a, a Australian scholar, uh, John Keane, who says um, they are so afraid of democracy, the, par the Communist Party, they act as if they're elected officials <laughs> um, <laughs> by responding. <laughs> to all the concerns to keep their legitimacy. Yeah. So there's that element, I just wanted to say that, to understand where China is going, because you can misunderstand easily, it's a repressive state, it's gonna collapse, not, not true. Second point though, what the McGurin Institute has been doing uh, for several years is we have a 21st century council, which is some former heads of state, some tech uh, leaders, and global intellectual types that have been meeting with Xi Jinping and Li uh, Lee, Lee, uh, Kaichang, the, the, the oh, yeah. prime minister, exactly for what you, you say. Mm -hmm to build a bridge of understanding. Like, how does your system work? How do you make decisions to build an airline or to buy Boeing, Airbus, Boeing or Airbuses? How does that process work, the deliberation process, et cetera? How to learn how their consensus and long-term orientation uh, is a form of governance that is a legitimate form of governance is, is, is feedback. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, one, but I do fear, as you, as you suggested, we're off on the distrust uh, track yeah. uh, and it's building. One thing that we are trying to do at the McGurin Institute is be sure that in that process, there is some kind of partnership on common intent. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, everything else would dwell in the shadow of distrust. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing with former Governor Jerry Brown and, um, and uh, the, the, the guy in China who negotiated the Paris Accord for the Chinese, mm -hmm. the Environmental Defense Fund, the yep. DiCaprio Foundation, is figure out how to integrate California's cap and trade market with China's. China modeled its cap and trade uh, carbon pricing market on California. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can link our climate fates, mm -hmm. despite all this other conflict going on, yep. uh, uh, and go beyond national security or trade issues to planetary issues, it becomes just an important ballast in the over relationship. Kind of like uh, Game of Thrones, the, the, the walkers are coming, we gotta come together, put those differences yep. aside. There's, there's at least 10 people who got the joke then. Right. And if you haven't seen it, please start watching it. No, not too late. Um, Who's, who's my timekeeper for Q&A? Is it time to go to Q&A? Yeah. Five minutes. Do I still, is it time? About five minutes. Five minutes, okay, good, because I have one other thing I want to uh, cover as well. So the last piece I want to end on is, is nationalism. I mean, if I, you, you describe two things, I would describe kind of three, and I think your book very much does talk about that, which is capitalism, democracy, and nationalism. To me are the three dominant threads. It was part of the, the end of history that Fukuyama talked about, like, We've won, yay, capitalism has won, yay, democracy has won. Well, maybe not. Uh, capitalism isn't exactly working for everybody, but you're right, it's conquered the world. And then the third piece was the idea, I think Fukuyama was maybe, and many big people pointed out at the end of the Cold War, that the nation state came back. The United States is a weird place because we didn't start as a nation, a group of people, and then form a state, like Germany or Italy or others. We started as a state nation. We were a state first, and then we had to figure out who we were as a people something we still struggle with, I think, all the time. But even within that, I was really pleased to see, and you quoted uh, former President Bill Clinton, the idea of positive nationalism versus a negative nationalism, because people are usually, I think, pretty intellectually lazy and say, oh, nationalism all bad. Um, you, you heard Macron say that, uh, kind of countering uh, Trump, because once you see a bad nationalism, you want to say all nationalism sucks, but the French are very nationalistic. They're very proud of, of, of the... Um, themes that came out of their nation building. Uh, most places are, and it's still our primary uh, form of identity, right? Uh, certainly outside our own borders, we, decide, we don't say first I'm a, a man or a woman. You don't say I'm a senior citizen or a millennial. You say, oh, I'm an American when you're traveling. Um, we don't have to, but that's still how we define ourselves. So in looking at this clash between, um, or this rivalry, or this uh, need to coexist between the US and China, it brings that out. China very much, has an identity of a pretty monocultural place, even though it's quite diverse, but uh, percentage-wise, it's much more monocultural than we are. Uh, a place like Los Angeles, 200 languages spoken, over 150 countries of origin, 39 countries with their largest population outside their home country, who are we? Culturally, it's not as easy to define, unless it's the shared culture of 
you know, uh, sh uh, Korean short rib tacos that unite us in a, in a um, you know, Twitter <laughs> informed uh, food truck. I mean, we, have, we are building a, a new sort of a culture, but what, where do you guys put um, nationalism in terms of uh, the positive force or the negative force to unite people? Because if you want to talk about predistribution and the feeling of obligation to one, each other, one another, it's because of this imagined community that we're all Americans. You're from St. Louis, I'm from Los Angeles, but somehow we're going to help each other before I help somebody in Tijuana who's closer to me geographically uh, than you were growing up. Um, what can we do to best harness that and maybe to inform what you suggest about capitalism and engagement with democracy? Uh, I think, um, uh, as, you said, as you said, the nation state is the legitimate place for democratic politics. And so the question of uh, fixing the dysfunctional politics and renovating democracy fits with the nationalism. If you want to have positive nationalism, you have to fix the dysfunctional political system. Um, the, uh, what, what, what Clinton says in, that, in the interview that's in the book, uh, he says, positive, positive nationalism is not uh, in conflict with global cooperation. It's the precondition for it, mm -hmm. which means take care of your people first. To take care of your people first, uh, in the sense he's talking about, is to dial back some of the hyper-globalization. Um, for example, well, Larry Summers, we quote there, the former Treasury Secretary, saying, well, when we talked about international trade negotiations, we want uh, patent rights for pharmaceutical companies in China instead of talking about shutting down tax uh, havens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we don't do the industrial policies or the policies to adjust when people are displaced from manufacturing jobs like they do in, 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 uh, in the Scandinavian countries, for example. There are a lot of things you need to do to compensate for globalization at the national level. That's positive nationalism. And it's also believing or having allegiance to, in America's case, to the inclusivity of, of what America's about, not to nationalist incantation. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different kind of nationalism than, than Trump promotes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exclusive, it's inclusive. Um, so, uh, uh, Dialing back hyper-globalization, uh, dealing on a global level with things that we, ha we can't deal with on our own, climate change, uh, pa pandemics, global financial flows. Um, and, then in, in the and then with China, to have some kind of a partnership to stem the rivalry, the strategic rivalry that's taking place. Mm -hmm. So it all, I think it all kind of fits together. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the idea of identity, you know, needs to be accepted and understood. So having an identity, being for yourself, mm -hmm. I think is good. But to be against everybody else, I mm -hmm. think is bad. So it's, it should be positive, it shouldn't be a negative. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Something that, that a, a few people could learn from <laughs> right now. And I think Los Angeles in many ways is the embodiment of that. I mean, we have a very strong identity here. And it's a sense, in the past we've talked about diversity or tolerance or inclusion. I like a different word than that, which is belonging, because inclusion implies somebody's including you, there's a hierarchy, diversity isn't very strong, but belonging is that deep emotional sense of what a nation can be about, and I think what the city is about, I and mean, potentially I, the nation as I was thinking the other day, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, I was thinking the other day, if you want to travel the world, the fastest way to travel the world is just go around LA, yeah. and you'll be everywhere. Yeah, this, that's very true. I mean. It's the cliche, but you see the face of the world on the streets of LA. And if you're lucky enough to grow up in Los Angeles, like I did, I found the face of Los Angeles on the streets of the world. I could at once be at home in Cairo or Mexico City or, or Bangkok because growing up here, there's a familiarity with that. That's absolutely. So with that, let's open up to, to questions from the audience. Um, got so if you'd uh, raise your hands, I'll bring the microphone to you. Just a quick reminder around here, questions typically start with a W or an H, sometimes <laughs> a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question. And tonight, only Mayor Garcetti gets to ask follow-up questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as we move from representative democracy towards direct democracy, it, most likely we will vote more. Uh, we will vote more basic, probably using these devices. Mm -hmm. uh, we are gonna vote or make choices on things at the street level, at the neighborhood level, at the city level, state level, national level, or maybe even on global things. As we vote, we will also create data. So for the first time, 
we will create new data, a massive amounts of data, not only on our behavioral patterns, but on our opinion. So in your opinion, who should manage that data, who should own that data, and who should, and how we should share that data? Thank you. Uh, we have some opinions, but I, you know, let's put everybody on the spot here. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer or he's telling me I should. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm teasing a little bit. We, we're supposed to answer, but you know, I, I think you're it. equally, uh, or maybe more qualified, well, look, it's interesting. I gave you the example of the, the scooters. Now, that's not a vote. But um, it was funny. The scooter companies initially were saying, do you really want Big Brother? They were taking ads out. Do you want Big Brother government knowing where you go on your electric scooter? Now, all we were asking for was anonymized data. Their counter to that was, yeah, but once you see that from that address that happens to be your home, the data that you go to Starbucks every single day, I can figure out it's you, and somebody can backtrack and know where you are. My counter to them was, yeah, you know him, and he's not anonymous. And you actually know he goes to Starbucks every day and can offer him 10% off at Starbucks. And so you're actually using that data and owning that in a way that isn't even to improve operations of a city. It's literally to make more money and to promote, um, to sell the data like the oil that you have. I think it's a very good question in the sense that government, you have to have the most safeguards. In the end, those companies all agreed, and we're going to put some requirements on that. It's only for folks to look at for a limited period of time. It gets purged. I think that's an important thing to, to look at over time. And to make sure that anonymized data isn't also something you can somehow work backwards and find out who it is. Because if we're able to, if somebody's able to take data and know how you voted, we take away the most important protection from democracy, which is that you can vote your conscience. And nobody will ever know. Um, so I certainly wouldn't want it in private hands. And I would be, I would say, government is best in very limited and constrained ways. That would be my answer. I think, I think that's, uh, I, I like it. I think that's the right answer. Uh, I also am not sure long term that that's realistic. I think, you know, people have to know that if wanted or if needed, that is going to become available and transparent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there may be safeguards, but rules yeah. change. <coughs> and, um, and, Democracy, you know, even though it has certain principles, some rights get taken away. So, no, we have, look, we have that voter data today. It's not through a device, but you can go back and see uh, who has voted with the name when you vote, right? Everybody who runs for election, oh, that person didn't even vote in 2005, and they get in trouble for it. So there are already, already those, those uh, sharing of it, and there are some limitations on that. We talked about making macro changes, but to do that, I think one of the distinctions that we have listening to you is that in China, the relationship between government and the individual is a known factor. The, 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 the quality and the quantity of what is expected from one another is very much delineated. Whereas here, now we see the crumbling of the relationship between the individual and the institutions. You know, if, if you think, I never imagined in my life that uh, that the FBI would be questioned as an institution in this in, the, in this country, so we see now that the crisis is more with the, with with believing that the institutions are there to actually uh, deliver a product, whatever their cons uh, constitution says they're going to deliver. So my question is, how can we ensure that whatever changes we are going to promote? Uh, can actually be sustained and when we feel that those institutions are becoming less and less powerful to be there for us. So I think your point in, in linking it to China, I think it actually is a good one. In China, you have a very, very strong and very vibrant private sector, but you have a very strong government. Here we have a very strong and vibrant private sector and a weaker and weaker government. Who's going to win? Between the two, if you put them one against the other, obviously the one that has both strong. And I think that, um, you know, long term, if we don't have a, a government that attracts the best, uh, or not the best, but people who are, um, you know, very talented, if if you're talented, if you just want to go to private sector, I think we're in trouble. We're lucky to have still 
attraction in government uh, for people who, frankly, sacrifice, in my mind, their lives uh, for all of us. So I think we're lucky. But it's going to be less and less the case if government is less and less appealing and if less and government has less and less respect uh, from society. So I think um, that's it's definitely a dangerous trend. And we, part of making certain changes within the system, meaning within democracy, is important so that you you know government again becomes uh, a place that is uh, respected and therefore uh, effective. If I understood your question, uh, <coughs> it's about trust in institutions and how to maintain those institutions. Uh, clearly, there's a breach between the governed, uh, the governing, and the governed, a total break almost now. Uh, and what we're trying to argue in the book again about citizen you, citizen engagement has to be there to restore trust in impartial institutions. The challenge is to be sure that citizen participation does not become populism or, or, or mob rule, uh, as this gentleman was suggesting about direct democracy in World War, uh, that there are mediating institutions that complement representative government, which itself is waning in its legitimacy. Um, so I think it's establishing that trust, and I don't know how you do it without more citizen engagement, and citizen engagement in a way that is mediated, again, to deal with magical thinking, conspiracy theories, hate speech, and all the rest. So when you talk about renovating democracy, I'm trying to understand what foundation you keep. Um, from what you've talked about, the, specifically the image of democracy around the tree, where you can all see each other, and it isn't just the popular vote, it's a discussion, it's self-government. Um, I, uh, this question came to me uh, very early, but um, how do you, it, you, in order to accomplish that, you need some kind of cultural change. And uh, in America, that seems like a tricky thing to do. What kind of cultural change are you imagining? And are you? <coughs> I, do, uh, I, I, do think, uh, I do think that a lot of what we're seeing in the polarization is actually a cultural, culture war. <clears throat> the debate over Trump and impeachment, just like all the rest of the debates with Trump, is really uh, played out on the cultural field about elites, coasts, uh, anywhere, somewhere, peoples, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I don't see how in a democratic and a secular society how you can come to consensual truths um, other than by democratic deliberation. So the only... The only mechanism there is, is to, is to find institutions that engage the public in a responsible way uh, so that they're a binding again between self-government and uh, the institution of self-government and people. Um, so I do believe it's culture, but, uh, but I think uh, a lot of the culture is driven by partisan politics. Um, any, all studies show that people uh, are less partisan than the parties vying for power. And these deliberative groups I keep talking about, like the one in Ireland last week, a highly emotional, polarized issue. When people are brought together in a depoliticized environment, which is not an electoral campaign, um, and discuss the issues and the options with the real facts before them, they tend to come to, to a consensus. So I think that's the path. I mean, how it works at the state level, local level, or beyond, I think will differ, but I think that's the path. And if I can chime in as well, I think Look, democracy gives you more freedom and more involvement, but it requires more work. Um, if you don't want to work, you can have less freedom. And there's other systems that just, they don't worry about the politics. We're going to give that to folks who know well. Uh, the Chinese system kind of embeds that. Um, but there's a million ways. I would say it's not so much changing the culture as, th as changing the practice. We just, there are a million ways to be involved today. Uh, yesterday, um, uh, somebody who sits on my youth uh, uh, advisory council there's an LAUSD student suggested and got the school board to put a motion forward that 16-year-olds should be able and 17-year-olds should be able to vote in school board elections. Now, there's a place to get involved today, and if you're a high school junior or senior, you know uh, Billie Eilish, who some of you may know, if you're you know 12 to 19, it's the most important musician in the world right now. She grew up here in Los Angeles with the kids from Parkland. Um, they came to me and asked to get a voter registration going before the midterm elections and to get high school students to pre-register or register themselves to vote. So Billie Eilish was kind enough to say whoever, whatever campus registers the most people gets a free Billie Eilish concert. This was before her album dropped. 
and Cleveland High School in the Valley got it, and it was crazy involved. And people saw that connection, not of a changed culture, like, please, you must be involved in democracy. Come on, people. It's literally just the practice. Open up the practice of it, and I think the rest will follow. We have time for two more questions. It's a great album, by the way. I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask something about, um, so Mayor Garcetti said something about energy, and I yeah. I think I'd been walking the dog. I had a conversation with a neighbor, and there was this conversation that revolved around sources of energy tapping, you know, the LA River as a potential source. I know it's going through a renovation or a, a urban renewal, if you will. And I can't help but think about solar, wind, uh, desalinization plants. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the ideas that have come up? around this conversation of alternative energies? Um, so, uh, good timing, and I didn't plan to. Next week we're releasing LA's Green New Deal, which is an update of uh, what we put out four years ago, the city's first sustainability plan. And it's really around five pillars, zero emission electricity, zero carbon electricity, zero emission transportation, zero emission buildings, a zero waste city, and 100% recycling of our wastewater. Uh, I was with Cory Booker two days ago when he was in town to, oh yeah, sorry, I don't mean to, to cut off the applause, please, you know, bring, um, and so take all I can get. Uh, exactly. It's so rare, I'll take it. You know, um, I took him to, if, when you take off an LAX and you look to the left, uh, that is called the Hyperion Treatment Plant. It's where we flush the toilet, about 80% of our wastewater goes, um, not some in the San Fernando Valley and other places, but about 80% of it goes there. It's the size of Disneyland. Uh, it generates through our toilets, our showers, our um, you know, washing machines and everything else, uh, more than enough energy to power it. We clean that water almost to a drinkable standard and put it out into the ocean. And I announced a couple, uh, about a month and a half ago, that we're going to recycle 100% of that water by 2035. Create a lot of jobs in doing that, but it's the equivalent of three LA aqueducts, just to give you an idea of the scope. It's like we all know what it took to steal water from the Owens Valley. This is three times more water. It would increase our water by 60%. So I think we don't need desal, but that's something that will help us through drought, through climate change, through resilience, um, and to have plenty of water to sustain life. Just next to it is a Scattergood um, power plant. Those are the two um, smokestacks that you see. And I announced that we're not going to repower that and two other natural gas power plants for a while natural gas was seen as better than the coal plants. But we saw with the leaks in the North Valley of methane gas just how destructive natural gas can be. And we have to get off of carbon, not just coal. Um, controversial, but I said we're going to shut those down and instead take that $4 billion and put it into what's now the number one solar city in America, more solar, wind. And we have to figure out a way to store that so the lights will go on at night even when the sun's not there. So hang tight. Look at it. Um, it's going to be all over the, the press. Uh, I think next week we're going to be kind of releasing that and talking a lot about it. But um, one last note I'd say is that while we did that, it's good for the environment, it's necessary, we generated 35,000 new green jobs in the last six years. That's more than all the coal jobs lost in America, and we're 1% of the population. So, you know, as we look at a fair economy, it's true. How do we own the rob robots? Certain things are going to be out of work. But there's a lot of new jobs, too, that are critical to making capitalism work. We just have to be embracing of them and get to the front of the line instead of having somebody else figure it out first. There's no reason we can't have power plants on every building here through solar power. There's no reason we can't store energy so when there's an earthquake, we don't have to worry that the power lines are cut off around on the San Andreas Fault and we don't have uh, water or electricity. So um, hold tight. I appreciate the question. I know it's not quite in the book, but it's relevant. Is that it? Can take one more, Ted? And our Let final question, final question for the evening. Hi, uh, thank you all for the talk. Um, Mayor, uh, yeah. I think you've called homelessness the greatest moral and humanitarian crisis of mm -hmm. our time, and you talked tonight that you uh, spent, um, yeah, most of your time on it. Um, democracy, you know, Prop Triple H uh, was passed by almost 80% of the people, but you get yeah. shouted down in Venice uh, yeah. or a bridge home project. So my question is, uh, how have you found uh, democracy tripping you up in this, pro in this uh, process? And to uh, Nicholas and Nathan, my question is if you have any uh, thoughts on that or even advice for the mayor as he attack attacks this problem here in LA. Uh, there's no question democracy slows us up all sorts of ways, not just the example you talk about where 
because we want to protect ourselves from bad things that have happened in the past, we make it easy for people to appeal a land use project and uh, with a hundred bucks and, and I oppose you, whether it's a homeless shelter, whether it's a luxury condominiums, we have a state law that has resulted in, in the best cases, us being protected from bad things and in the worst cases that it costs much more to build things here and they go much more slowly and they can be stopped by a handful of people. So I think there is a, a balance to that. I'm, a, I'm of the philosophy kind of like the democracy question, just do things and things usually are better. Let's jump in and let's be a culture of trying rather than being so scared to try. Because when we opened up a homeless, you know, this bridge home, homeless uh, facility downtown in El, El Pueblo, tents are 60% down, crime is down by over 60%. We've helped 300 people get off the streets. It's actually working and guess what? Crime didn't go up, the opposite happened. It didn't attract, so those fears I understand and never dismiss. Democracy requires that hard work though. You can't, if you want to keep the democratic system, and I absolutely do, I would never trade it in for any other system. It requires you put in that time, not just to say, hey, I've got a good idea and I have to go through the motions of democracy, but make sure the rules are changed and are fluid enough to have the balance of doing at the same time that you're thinking, and secondarily, make sure that as you do it, you don't dismiss people's fears. Part of the democracy is listening to each other and we've forgotten how to do that. In Venice, I know you talked about it and there's, there is a lawsuit going on there, but I'm confident we'll get that done and two thirds of Venice polled wants it. Now, a lot of people were upset about crime in their neighborhood and I said, that doesn't mean homelessness and you should hold me accountable on crime and what we can do to get more police presence to ensure that whether somebody's homeless or not homeless is committing a crime, you deserve those services. And I stayed at that town hall for four and a half hours my, my folks told me to go home. It was the rudest town hall I've ever been a part of from some people who were like, shut the fuck up. And you know, they were telling that to the police chief and he has a gun and a badge. And I was like, whoa, this is intense. But even though I could have left after two and a half hours, long after the cameras left, and I think the impact not just of social media, but a media age, people perform much more, it calmed down. People said, you're gonna leave. And I said, no, I will stay here till every last person, which I can't do tonight, sorry. Um, it comes up to me, asks a question, has it answered until there was nobody left in that room. That didn't mean we agreed at the end. I said, I still am convinced we should do this, but I appreciate I have some other work to do to address your concerns. And there was something about hearing each other that long that made democracy work. In a Twitter and social media age, if we don't put in the time to listen, to think, and most importantly, to hear each other, democracy will fail. But if you do, it doesn't mean you get your way always, but you have a much better shot while you're doing, I think what this book says, reform, and be the writers of the democratic system at any point. Don't assume that some genius 200 years ago had it all figured out and we can never touch it. So. Can't answer better than that. <laughs> um, so, so I know we're over. Uh, th I did hear that, that no women were picked. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that's what I just said. There was, there was no woman that asked a question. Do you wanna ask one real quick? I, I know there's one right here and there. I don't, yeah, want, to, I, I don't want to pick because you, you make one friend and a bunch of enemies. But go, go ahead, Ted. You, you decide who's, who's... Thank you. I have a question uh, that's really... Um, it's uh, very deep to me and very intimate. Um, my family's been very involved with politics. I'm a descendant of the first um, U.S. African-American senator, Hiram Revels. Like, mm. you know, a gentleman asked me why I was here. My family's been very civically engaged, right? Mm. I used to work in Silicon Valley at Stanford. I'd fly back to my home in LA. I live less than a mile away from where Nipsey Hussle was killed, mm -hmm. right? So where I live in a black neighborhood, which is middle class, which goes to lower class very quickly, mm -hmm. it might as well be Mars compared to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I used to have a place in Mountain View adjacent to Google and we talk about belonging or inclusivity and democracy. And I haven't heard anything about like race and mm -hmm. I'm African American. And you know, how do we get um, some of the, 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 the companies to open up? How do we get uh, more diversity, more diversity regarding like who is wealthy at the very, very top? Like yeah. um, being able to like live in Silicon Valley is like, I mean, you know, you talk about the bridges with, um, um, you know, China, I totally agree. Like working up at an international university, we need to have those dialogues. And even the students that are international feel like they've been segregated. I'll get it, I'm sorry, but like, I guess I want to know how you build those bridges yeah. among disadvantaged and racially diverse within here as well. You guys want to jump in or you want to tell? Okay, it's a town hall with Eric Garcetti. So, I, um, <laughs> thank you for that question. Oh, it's a necessary it, it, perspective and, and one should, that 
You should answer, but it's not yeah. fair. Also, no, no, I don't. I, don't, I, don't worry. I, I love this, and I, I don't want to take away from you guys. Please do buy the book; it's really great. Um, <laughs> so, so um, I'll tell you how we approach it because I didn't want to be a bystander, and we didn't wait for hashtags, uh, Oscars so white, or Me Too, Times Up, to look at inclusivity. Um, within six months, becoming mayor I made more than half of the commissions and boards that oversee the Port of LA and the airport and the LAPD women for the first time in our history. And we're seen as being slow in the public sector compared to the private sector. Most companies are still struggling to get to 10% for their C-suites and their, and their uh, boards. Um, in terms of racial equality, uh, we looked at, for instance, Hollywood and started the Evolve Entertainment Fund, which will have over 1,000 people in paid internships with mentors by the end of next year, 78% um, of whom are women and 95% plus who are of color, primarily black and brown, uh, to get narrators into those stories, like Nipsey, who was working with us on all sorts of ways of bringing entrepreneurialism, to folks, especially to folks who've been criminally justice involved. Um, the way we, we are hiring in our own city government. We have a targeted local hire for kids that are coming out of foster uh, system um, who have been in war, who have been homeless, or in the criminal justice system, disproportionately folks of color. And in the tech industry, which you singled out, we started, I think, the first in the country initiative called Pledge LA. We have over 100 companies and their capital funders from venture capital uh, opening up all their books of the racial and gender makeup of their employees, taking pledges to hire folks of color and women. And then we've offered them this carrot of also get engaged with helping us bring your brilliance to homelessness, traffic, and all the things that don't just develop your app, but help your community and don't exist in, in a vacuum. So I think, um, you know, my challenge, I always push out is this is everybody's struggle. It's, a, it's not a struggle for African Americans to have racial inclusivity any more than it's women's struggle who are disproportionately the victims and survivors of sexual violence to, to, to take on that battle as ours. And men shouldn't do it just because they have a mother or a sister or a daughter. Do it because you're a human being. Um, and, in, and, and in LA, the last thing I'll say is I think we have been and can be that bridge to Asia. Um, because if you look at communities, I think one of the best ways that we can make these bridges happen is by bringing Latino, African-American kids to places like China to create those relationships now. Because Chinese have an image of America as just white, male, wealthy, when, and they see themselves still very much as underdogs. And there's a magical thing that happens when you combine folks who are underdogs here with a country that still thinks of itself as that, even though they're about to be number one in many measures. We've made community college free in this city. And one of the things we started doing was mayor's youth ambassadors were kids who have never had anybody in their uh, family go to college are going to Egypt, Mexico, Japan. We're expanding to about 10 other countries to go for the first time. They've never been on a plane, let alone going to these countries to be our ambassadors from LA. And the last thing I'll say is leading up to the Olympics, we got the chance to do exactly what Nicholas said. In 84, when I was a kid and the Olympics came to town, it was like, wow, the world came to LA. And f after that, LA was much more in the world. And leading up to the Paralympics and the Olympics, we've got to show the world what a modern city is in terms of democracy, capitalism, innovation, but a sense of identity, too, that includes all of us. So they see that face of an America that um, doesn't close itself off from the world. When we were bidding for the Olympics, uh, you know, Trump had just been elected. The Muslim ban came in. They're like, really? Can we even get our athletes in? And I said, look, don't pick, it. Don't pick America, and we're good at turning into ourselves and away from the world. So go for it and help reinforce that. Or in this moment, help us open up again and remind Americans that we are of and in the world. And they said, okay, that's a good idea. And they gave us the Olympics and the Paralympics. But I think it is the time for us in this next decade to make sure we don't just rest on our laurels because there's a lot of work to do in racial equality, a lot of work to do in gender equality and economic opportunity. Um, but I think we have to be willing to reform our democracy. We have to be willing to think about what it, whether it's... Uh, pre-distribution or other things, we have to think about how capitalism can work for everybody and have a sense of what that identity is all about. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Let's thank Nathan and thank Nicholas for...